Okay, I got it. They were so tickled. All right, good evening. It's uh, time for Get Started. Um, got a big crowd tonight. Appreciate everyone being here. Got a big group of young people. I uh, think I heard over 30-something here for the young people's meal. Uh, appreciate all the adults that were involved in that and putting it together. Uh, appreciate everyone being here tonight. Hope everyone's had a good week. I think we're supposed to get two tenths of an inch of rain in the morning, so it's better than none. I heard that, Nancy. I did hear that, that it was supposed to be a bad cold spell by Halloween. But it's supposed to be 82 Saturday, so uh, we can wait on that cold spell. Uh, I can, anyway. Um, yeah, I don't like it. Let's see here. Uh, Aiden will have her first song, and then uh, Joe will have her invitation song. Um, who's devotional tonight? But Dwayne have her devotional, uh, and I'll have her opening prayer. Uh, update on the sick. Uh, Becky Hodum uh, had a doctor's appointment. Tupelo is having uh, trouble again. I think the text said it's the same trouble she had about a year ago. Uh, so please remember Becky. Uh, Joan Jones is homesick, uh, uh, had having stomach issues. Uh, Miss Jones just had a rough time with it the last few weeks. So please remember her. Um, Diane Broadway gets two shots tomorrow. Uh, Brother Mike said she's excited, hoping that uh, you know the last shot didn't work, didn't give her any relief. So hoping the two that she gets tomorrow will give her some relief. Uh, remember Wayne uh, Kahn, little Rhett Miller's got RSV, so remember him. Uh, Wallace Benjamin's doing some better. Uh, he goes to the West Clinic uh, next week, uh, and so Wallace continues to do a lot better, and we're thankful for that. Uh, Bobby Stevens still home uh, recovering. Uh, Faye's uh, not had a good day. She's been in the bed all day, so uh, please remember Sister Faye. Uh, Carolyn Markle uh, not feeling well. I don't have an update on her. Um, let's see here. Miss Samantha's back. It's good to see her, and she's feeling good enough to be back with us tonight. Uh, Dorothy Smith, uh, you got. You still don't have any results yet. Uh, Miss Dorothy uh, still waiting on results from um, her biopsy. So please remember her. Ruth Lauterbach's daughter, Cindy, don't, please don't forget about her. Um, she was diagnosed with cancer and waiting next steps. Terry Roy's sister, uh, Leanne Birkins, uh, has stage uh, four cancer in three different places. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jerry Crum uh, continues to re recover from his heart surgery and went well. And then... Uh, Millie Maxey, uh, this is, uh, was in the hospital on, uh, in Tupelo with RSV. So RSV with those little ones, uh, uh, seems like it's a lot more these days and uh, can be pretty rough on them. So please remember them. I think that's all I have. Don't forget the Johnson family and Miss Aline uh, passing away. Also, um, uh, Ricky um, Holland's uh, wife, Nina, they laid her to rest at uh, Acton yesterday. Uh, and then, uh, seems like there was someone else uh, we announced. I um, can't remember who it was. Oh, uh, Shirley Dees. Uh, Carolyn and uh, Roy's not here to get an update on Shirley D's. Uh, this is Rita's mom down in Florida. She's uh, went out Sunday evening. She's got heart problems, and they had two cardiologists 
uh, working to figure out what to do next steps with her. So please remember her. Is there others we need to update? Sick? Or any sick that we have updates on? Please don't forget those in nursing home. We did announce that Tommy uh, Fowler uh, fell and broke his hip and uh, had been through uh, going through rehab, uh, but he's back in the nursing home, so please remember Tommy. Uh, don't forget about the sprinkle shower this uh, Sunday for Ethan and Leah. Uh, bring your diapers and wipes and uh, lay them on uh, the table in the foyer. Also, beginning the 29th of October's pictures for the congregation uh, for a um, directory. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet on 15-minute slots right outside uh, on the table, clipboard underneath the TV. Uh, got two, we'll have two cameras going and uh, trying to uh, get, get that done uh, pretty quickly. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Don't forget uh, women's encouragement class tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, appreciate everyone uh, tonight and as, uh, as well. I think that's all I've got. Anything else? All right, we'll have our opening prayer, and then Aiden will come up and lead us in a song, and then uh, after the devotional, Joe will have our uh, invitation song. Let's pray together. Our most loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for uh, this day, for midweek Bible study, Father, to be able to come together and to open up your word and to study from it. Um, we're thankful for Dwayne and Father for uh, the devotional he's prepared, Father, as an invitation. We pray, Father, if there's anyone here that has not responded to the gospel message and the invitation, that, and they've been thinking about it, Father, that they'll um, respond tonight and um, make that great confession, that repentance, and be baptized for the mission of their sins, Father, before it's too late. Uh, if there's those that are uh, just need uh, uh, prayers, Father, and encouragement. We pray, Father, that they will use this time as well um, to encourage us as we encourage them. Uh, we're thankful for uh, Brother Lawrence as he teaches class tonight and the re re other teachers that are teaching classes uh, this midweek. And we're thankful for the extra work and that they put uh, forth in studying out your word and putting lessons together. Uh, Father, we pray and thankful for all of our young people that we have here on Wednesday night. Uh, we pray that you bless them and uh, help them, Father, as they seek to find their way in this world. Uh, Father, that they help them to put you first. Uh, Father, and help them to trust and have faith that you will watch over them and lead them in the right direction. Help us, Father, as older ones to help uh, encourage and, and guide them, Father, towards your Son. Father, we're mindful of those that we just talked about on our prayer list. Um, several, Father, that we gave updates on and uh, continue to have issues. We pray for each of them and for the troubles that they're having, Father, that they will be lifted if it's your will. There's others, Father, that we didn't mention that are on our prayer list. We didn't call them by name, but uh, they continue to have issues, and we pray for them as well, Father. You know who they are and what their needs are. And, Father, we're thankful most of all for Jesus, thankful for his love for us. Father, we're mindful of uh, the situation that's going on in Israel and Gaza and uh, all the lost lives, Father, needless uh, death. We pray, Father, for everyone that is over there, especially those that have captive. Pray that you watch over them and keep them safe. Our own uh, people, Father, are involved in that, and we pray for them and their safety as well. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, and in his precious name we pray. Amen. Hey, before Aiden comes up, somebody lost a shovel. It's a keychain. I'll lay it up here in case somebody it was out in the foyer, in case you realize you lost your shovel. <laughs>
All right, I <laughs> Not yours, Nancy. What was that? I will be singing I'll Fly Away 243. First and last verse. I'll Fly Away 243. Some glad morning when this life is over. Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see you here tonight. Uh, I'm go two different directions I could go on, on my comments. I think I'll start with talking about the pagan philosophers in Acts 17 that Paul talked to. Uh, beginning at verse 18. I've looked into more about the Epicureans and the Stoics, and I found some interesting things about them. The only thing they have in common with Christianity is that they believe in that the highest goal is to seek a heart at peace. Peace of heart is their goal, as is Christianity. But that's where the comparison ends. The Epicureans believe that you find uh, peace of heart by indulging in all kinds of sins of the flesh. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Just enjoy yourself while you can, because there's no resurrection. That's what they believe. The Stoics didn't believe in a resurrection either. They believe that the only way you can have peace of heart is not care about anything or anyone. They even had step by step how you could start doing that. <clears throat> First, pick up some inanimate object like a, a cup in your house uh, and your favorite mug. Break it into pieces. Then convince yourself you don't care about that thing. Don't be attached to anything. Then maybe pick out one of your best of your livestock or a pet or something. Take it off in the woods. Even kill it. Slaughter it. And then convince yourself I don't care. That don't bother me at all. And then you get to your family, your spouse, your kids. Run them off. Give them to somebody. Let them go out on the street and beg. Be homeless. But don't let yourself care about anyone or anything. What a terrible way to live. That's completely the opposite of what the Bible tells us to do and to be. Number one, the Epicureans, we're told to exercise self-control. Galatians chapter 5, beginning about verse 16, the 
lust of the flesh, you can get rid of it if you'll walk in the Spirit. And he goes on to say the Spirit, the, the, the desires of the Spirit are antagonistic or against the lust of the flesh or the lust of the Spirit or against the lust of the flesh. And he says it backwards. The lust of the flesh are against the Spirit. Exercise self-control. Now, there are some situations where the desires of the flesh are appropriate, like in marriage, marriage 13, verse 4. Uh, marriage is honorable in all, and the, and the bed undefiled. The marriage bed is undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And then he says a whole chapter on marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, and in verse 9 he says, To the widows, the, those who are not married but are widows, and those who have never married, go ahead and marry if you can't contain yourself. If you can't control your lust, your desires for each other, it's better to marry than to burn. And he's not talking about hell there. It's better to mar marry than to burn in your lust for each other. Go ahead and get married. That's the way the Bible takes care of it. It's only natural then that the idea of Christian love would be antagonistic, a revolution against the large part of pagan thought. Agape love, the supreme form of love, uh, was born within the very bosom of uh, the revealed gospel of Jesus Christ. Christian love is the reflection of God's love in whose image we were made and whose pattern of love we're intended to imitate. Matthew 5, verse beginning at 43. And Paul's description of love in Romans 12, beginning at verse 9, teaches us that we should not only uh, think about other people, but we should care intensely for other people. To emphasize and sympathize and empathize so that we can see and feel with the one that we're trying to help. To identify with their joys, but also with their sorrow, which you and I will always face if we hadn't already. Now, the, the verse that I was going to start with and decided to back up and go over that is... Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. In the King James it says, or verse 28 beginning, in the King James it says, Come to me, all of you who are burdened, all of you who are hurting and are burdened, and I'll give you rest. We're not talking about the final rest when we go to heaven. We're not talking about where death and pain and struggling don't, end, don't even exist anymore. We're not talking about that. This is a rest that we, this is from vine. Let me read this. The burdens that he talks about, Jesus talks about, is probably thinking of the burdens of the Pharisees. Matthew 23, they'll, they'll bind heavy burdens on other people's back, but they won't lift one finger to lift them. And then he says, Christ's rest is not a rest from work. It's a rest in work. Not the rest of, inact of inactivity, that's not the kind of rest we're talking about. We all need to be busy doing something in the Christian life, but of the harmonious working of all the faculties, all the affection of our will, of our heart, of our imagination, of our conscience, because each has found in God the ideal place for its satisfaction and development. That's the kind of rest we're talking about. Now let me read it from Brother Hugo McCord's translation. Come to me, all of you who are struggling and are yet burdened, and I will refresh you. That's the kind of rest we're talking about, a revival, a refreshing of the Spirit from the inside. Take my yoke, my harness, and learn from me. But that's absolutely necessary in order to know the peace of God. And for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, you will find refreshment for your souls. For my yoke is pleasant, not just carable, 
My harness is not doesn't chafe you. It's pleasant. You'll be glad to do wear this harness, this yoke. And my load is light. It's absolutely true that one of the great motivations for doing right is the fear of eternal punishment. That's mentioned at least about eight, I'd say eight to ten times in the Bible. Eleven of those ten times that the word is used, it's used by Jesus Christ. He wants you to know you need to do whatever you can not to perish. But on almost every page of the Bible it talks about the love of God being our motivation. John didn't say the, the apostle of love. John, he wrote five books of the, of the New Testament. And he's called the apostle of love. He didn't say, we love him because we want to stay out of hell. That would be a good reason, even if you did it for that reason, obeyed the gospel for that reason. But he says, we love him because he first loved us. And we respond to that love by loving him back. He deserves, he's worthy of our worship. Jesus came to earth, died on a cruel cross, and was resurrected the third day. He died to, that we might be cleansed by his blood. Blood, the spilling of blood was absolutely necessary for the remission of sins. But it had to be the blood of a spotless lamb or the spotless lamb of God as Jesus was. No sin. No guile in his mouth. But his death on the cross, if you don't respond, if, and you need to respond, if you're not a child of God and you need to become one tonight, or you're an erring child of God and need to be restored, and you don't come, then his death was in vain as far as you're concerned. We don't want it to be in vain for anyone. He died for all. But don't let it be in vain or for nothing in your life is what we're asking. Let it be for something. And love him because he first loved you. Come confessing the name of Christ, the sweetest name on earth. Turn from your sins and repentance, whatever's against his will, and be baptized for the remission of all sins. Or if you've already done that and you've strayed from the way, come saying, I'm sorry, Lord. I want the forgiveness of you. And you ask him first, and then you ask us if, if we know about it so we can pray with you and for you because we're sinners too. We're all subject to it. Repent and pray. That's the first time that anyone strayed from the gospel and was told what to do. Acts 8 and verse 22. Simon, who became a Christian, was told when he let bitterness back in his heart, repent and pray. And I think he did because he said, you pray for me, Peter. And we'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. Why? Because we want you to be saved and Jesus wants you to be saved. Why don't you come while we stand and sing? Just as I am.
Whoops. Say it again. Good evening. Good evening. It's enjoyable to be standing up here, especially if you've got the Word of God to talk about. And I'm sure there's a number of people in this congregation that would agree with that. And it's good to come and hear the Word of God, and, to, and even better to put it into practice. Now, we're in the part of Ephesians where Paul is writing about how to put it into practice. All the good things that he mentioned in the first three chapters uh, are being applied uh, to the Ephesians and to us as to how we should walk. And we've looked at several ways in which we walk. And at the end, last week, we got down to the part about walking in wisdom. And when one walks in wisdom, the, one of the things that he said was to, to not be filled with wine. And I suppose he would say anything else that would intoxicate you or rob you of your mental ability, your judgment. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. And when do we receive the Holy Spirit? By the way, hmm? when we're baptized into Christ, that's part of the promise in Acts 2 verse 38, among other places. And so he said, it, while we're walking in the spirit, living in the spirit, then filled with the spirit, then we need to speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, sing and make melody, or as the Hugo McCord translation says, pluck the heartstrings uh, to God, and then give thanks, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ Amen. to God, even the Father, always giving thanks. Can you ever run out of matters to give thanks? I remember something that my mother told me when I was a child. She, she got to attend Fred Hardeman for one year, and then her mother died and she had to drop out, so she never got to go back. But she said, Brother N.B. Hardeman, teaching them about prayer, he said, when you pray, you first need to give thanks to God Amen. for all the blessings that he's given you before you ever ask him for anything. For, and then, you know, on top of that, I think it would be good to keep, remember what we've asked him for when he answers us, then to thank him for the answer. And answers can be, wait a while. They can be not that, but this. But it's always the right answer that he gives. And so we should thank him for hearing our prayers. Well, we come down to verse 21. Part of, of being filled with the Spirit or result of being filled with the Spirit is being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Maybe a lot of people don't think about fearing Christ. But if you, if you read uh, Revelation chapter 1, where this figure appears to John, the apostle. And he is so glorious. He is so mighty. He's scary. And John said, I became like a dead man. And, and, and he laid his hands on him and said, fear not, it is I. He was Jesus in all his glory. And, but he died for us. And that takes away uh, the bad kind of fear. But I need to respect him and honor him and hold him holy at all times. And if I'm going to do that, then my brothers and sisters, 
I need to be one that ranks myself under you. And we all need to rank ourselves under each other. It is impossible for us to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace if we are thinking our, of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Amen. If we are putting our own desires and wants before those of others. Amen. Sometimes, you know, when a child reaches for something they've been told not to reach, they may give a tap on the hand. Uh, that's a lot better than sticking their fingers in the fire or in the electric socket. But, you know, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> a perfectly good illustration. But, uh, yes, he does. And so we need that. But we need to care about each other. And, and love each other. And so, following this, there's, a, there's disagreement among commentators about where verse 21 goes. Whether it goes with what's above or if it goes with what's below. And if somebody were to ask me, as I've tried to study that, where does verse 21 go? Does it go with 20 or does it go with 22? And I'd say yes. Because you're coming out of a, out of a, a great subject of, of being filled with the Spirit. And there are all these things that have to do with being filled with the Spirit. And then we get to this part of mutual submission. And that introduces several examples here. Paul introduces several examples of mutual submission. Of mutually ranking the other person better than ourselves. And the place he goes first is marriage. In marriage you have two people who hardly know anything about each other. In some countries where the parents have chosen uh, who they're going to marry, they know nothing about each other. Except maybe a name. But... You know, you don't know as much as you thought you knew. Even if you've known this person for a couple of years and been around them at times, you still don't know. So you have to, we have to have help, and that help is each one considering the other is more important than themselves in marriage. And so he, he starts out with wives and... The word be subject is not in the Greek. Said that, I think, last week, but that was just preliminarily. It is not there. It reads like this if we start with verse 21. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives to your husbands. You see why you don't need that be subject to. Wives to your husbands, as to the Lord. First of all, we are all subject to the Lord, Jesus Christ. We are all to be subject to Him. We are all ranked under Him. And if we are ranked under Him, then the organization of the home as God made it, He made the man first and then He made the woman. Paul says in another of his letters, he said, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. What do you mean? Adam went ahead and sinned knowing he was sinning. Adam was the one who was told first. And he had the, the responsibility as the first maid. He's the firstborn of God to tell Eve what is right and wrong. Now maybe she was so pretty and he'd never had an occasion where he had to correct her for anything that he found it hard to correct her. But, the, but Genesis tells us that he was right there as she was being tempted by the serpent. He was there. 
It says she took it and ate it and gave it to her husband who was there with her. That is why Paul says in Romans that the first one to sin was Adam, not Eve. Adam was the first to sin because he did not keep his responsibility to his wife. But if the husband is doing what he should do, being subject to him should not be a problem. If his first concern is for for what's good for her. Because that's what he goes ahead and says. And noticed that in this passage it does not say wives obey your husbands. Doesn't say obey, but if you are subject to him, you're going to listen to him. And when he's, he's the one in charge, he's the one that has, is responsible for making decisions for the whole family. And if he makes the wrong decision, he's the one in trouble. Now, should he listen to his wife? Well, let's, let's get down here. The, He says, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. And we know we have no problem in understanding that we as the church need to listen to Christ. We need to hear what he has to say and be subject to him. And it says, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ... So also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. That pretty well covers it. But still, it's not this thing of the husband saying, you've got to do what I say. It's not browbeating her. That's not what it is. The husband's the boss of the wife. Huh? The husband's the boss of the wife. He's the slave driver of the wife. Maybe... Maybe in some families there are slave drivers. But so wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, now here's where we come to the, what I think is the hardest part. Now some of you ladies might think it's not. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What is the measure of love in this verse? And what did he do that shows he loved the church? He sacrificed himself. So doesn't that mean I should sacrifice myself for my wife? Shouldn't I give myself up for her? That's what Love is something you do. It's a command here. It is not a feeling. It is n- I know I've told this to some of you and maybe everybody, but I'll say it again. We were in a uh, language course in Kenya and there was a German man there who was a professor of Shakespeare. And for some reason he was in Kenya and he was studying a language there. And he told us, he said, you know, when Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, parents decided who their children would marry. And, and Shakespeare wrote it to show the folly of the two people deciding themselves who they're going to marry. He did not write it to show Uh, the wonderful thing about romantic love because what happened to Romeo and Juliet? They died. Not a good ending. And and because our culture has changed so vastly and we watch all the sweet little movies on TV and read the romantic novels and all of this, then we think that romance is, is the thing. But it's not. Wisdom is a whole lot more important than romance. 
uh, doing right by each other is a lot more important than looking good. And, and all those things, will that sort of thing will see you through many hardships, many difficult years, as well as the good times. And so husbands are commanded to love their wives. How many people say to their mate, I don't love you anymore, I want a divorce in our day and age? How many times does that happen? I don't love you anymore. Well, that's a confession to disobedience to God. I'm sinning against you and against God because I don't love you anymore. In Hollywood, it's probably 100%. Yeah, maybe. may be. When I was a child, we had a family across the street, the, uh, the father and mother and their daughter, who was, who was close to 50 at the time, who had been married four or five times. She was about to catch up with the woman at the well. And that was, that was an unusual thing at that time. Well, I won't tell you how many years ago that is. Yeah. At least 65 years ago, if not more. So husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Christ loved the church, died for it, so that he might sanctify her, set her apart for God's purposes having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. The word of the gospel is spoken and people are cleansed when they are baptized. It is Jesus that cleanses them, not the water. But it is the cleansing of water because it happens when they are immersed into Christ. And so Jesus did that so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. There's nobody else who presented his bride to him, but Jesus presented his own bride to himself. He did that. There was no one else to do it. He's the one that died for her. To make her holy and pure and blameless. And so you have the picture of the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven in, in the book of Revelation. Which is the bride of Christ in all her glory and splendor. And that's the way Jesus sees her. That's the way he sees us. Because he's blotted out our transgressions. As long as we keep following him, he keeps blotting them out. So when we appear before him, he will see us as his glorious body, his glorious church, his bride. And so that's how the husband's supposed to love his wife. So he says, so husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Now if a husband is doing all of that for his wife, is it, tell me, is it hard for her to be submissive to him? To let him be the head? You know, what does the head do as far as the body is concerned? Since she's his body, he's the head, just like Christ is the head of the church. What does the head do for the body? Takes care of it. Takes care of it. Does the head notice if the body is in pain? You better believe it. Uh, the head decides to quit doing whatever that is that's hurting, <laughs> you know. Sometimes maybe it's just need to quit doing that. Don't eat that. And so the husband, as the head, pays attention to what the wife is telling him. We have this, our bodies are constructed and there's this very small 
part of our body that connects the brain to all the different parts of the body. And a signal can come from anywhere. And instantly you know where that is. And, uh, you know, I always think about when I drilled a hole in my finger, you know. It was stupid <laughs> how I did it. But still I did it. Well, the drill went flying, and and I got I bent all over, and my hand went on to my finger, and I was like this, and I was jumping up and down. Every inch of me was in sympathy with that finger, <laughs> you know. Now I can't even find the scar or so, something. So. A husband, if he, if he loves his wife, that's how it's going to be. And he says, because we are members of his body. We're members of Christ's body. And so we take care of our own uh, members, our wife, wives. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, sometimes there's not enough leaving of father and mother. Sometimes there's uh, too much going back and telling mom or dad what he or she is doing. And, and I've heard of a mother telling her son or her daughter, don't ever come and tell me anything that this husband or this wife of yours has done that's wrong. Don't ever tell me. I don't want to know it. I don't want to be their enemy. I don't want to be then a, a spoiler in that marriage. You handle it. Don't tell me about it. And so, now, this brings us down to verse 20, 32. The mystery is great. But I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The big subject here is what? What is the major subject in this whole book? Christ and the church. Now we need to get these marriages right. Our, our relationships with each other right. So that the church can be all he means for it to be. So that we can preserve the unity of the spirit. The bond of peace. This congregation will be no stronger than its, its families. The families are important. What? This nation won't either. Do what? This nation won't. This nation won't. Uh, Back about 1964 or 5, uh, some person in power in this nation decided to give government money to women who didn't have husbands at home. So that the husband would be the government. And they have, and before that, those people had strong families. And when they did that, then the men had no function. They had no use. So how much do you think they wanted to stay around the children? And how much guidance then did they give to the children? Do you think they ever pitched a baseball to their child, son? Did they ever take one of their children fishing? Did they ever sit there while they were looking at TV and say, now you see what that guy just did in that? That's wrong, son. That's wrong, daughter. And so they set about to destroy the family. And as I understand, that is the primary, one of the primary uh, ways of operation in the Communist Manifesto to destroy the family. So 
So I find it hard to think that a Christian could be a communist. Not in good standing. <laughs> he, might live, he or she might live in a country that's communist and, and have to abide by the laws. But you can't be a, a, a good communist and be a Christian. Not if you think the family's unimportant. And so we have a, we have a job to work uh, uh, doing. And I'm not talking about campaigning for some candidate. To help this country be better, folks, we need to be following what we're studying in this passage. And we need to make it prime, prime territory in our homes. With the, in front of our children. And your children are going to learn from how mom and dad get along. And one thing they need to learn from is when mom or dad says I'm sorry to the other. They need to see that. They need to hear that. I did wrong. I'm sorry. All of that needs to be right there in front of the kids so they know what to expect and how to live their lives. And we can do that because we have a Savior that paid for our sins. I can confess my sins because He's promised to forgive me. <coughs> Excuse me if I sound like I'm preaching. But it's pretty serious stuff. And so he goes, he, his summary verse in this chapter is, Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Uh, how many husbands and wives get discussed at the workplace when they're not present probably every day hmm? probably every day every day there's lots I said didn't say how, what, how many days I said how many I wonder what percentage gets <laughs> gets discussed I hope you've never talked about your husband or your wife at work in a negative way and I hope you never do and if you have quit it you know, we used to ask, we used to talk about, you know, husbands shouldn't beat their wives over in Kenya. And, and these men would say, well, I want you to know, now that I'm a Christian, I've stopped beating my wife. That was serious stuff. Yeah, you can stop it. And Jesus helped them. I, I, I remember driving down a path and seeing a man take a stick to his wife and just wallop her. <laughs> Made me mad. I, I guess a policeman would tell me don't get involved in a domestic dispute, but I said to him, man, you're not acting like much of a man what you're doing there. Yeah. In the Muslim community, women are just chattels. They're chattels, yes. Well, they were worth about 10 head of cattle in Kenya. You know, and they, in some tribes, in some situations before Christ, they're, they're ranked right along with the children. Same words used for all of them. But they learn different. Christ changes things. And what we, what is enjoyed in our culture, at least where people follow Christ, is something far better than many centuries of the world's uh, existence but it's going back to what God originally intended well we'll talk about the rest of the family next week any questions let's bow our heads Father I thank you for this group of people here who listen intently and who I know want to do what your word tells us to do. 
We all do, Father. And we want our families to be better than they've been. And we know there's always room for improvement. We want to please you, dear Lord. And Jesus, our Savior, the head of the body, the church, we want to, we want to fulfill your purpose in saving us. So be with us as we leave this place. Be with us as we go our ways. Be with us as we try to live these things before our children and our neighbors and show respect and love to each other. 